Okay, macro unit one, screencast two, this one about calculating GDP. As you'll remember, we're going to go with the expenditures approach to calculating GDP, which again says add up all the money everyone's spending on goods and services, um, and that's what GDP is for a year. Again, GDP being a measure of how much stuff we make, which is a kind of a proxy for how, the extent to which we're satisfying human wants and needs. Now in the end, we're going to get a formula for GDP, and the formula is going to look like this. GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus X sub N. And most of what the screencast today is about is what those letters mean, and why they're added together like that, and why they equal GDP. Alright, so let's start with those letters. GDP equals C plus I plus G plus X sub N, and we're going to start with C. C stands for consumption spending sometimes called personal consumption expenditures, sometimes called consumer spending. And that's exactly what it is. C is spending by consumers in the economy. So that's spending by you, by me, your parents, your dog, whatever. Now, this is actually the largest component of GDP. 70% of all the spending done in the economy is done by consumers. So this is a really important number. And in fact, when economists want to see how the economy is doing, or predict how the economy is likely going to do, one of the things they look at is consumer confidence, what they call consumer confidence, um, meaning the extent to which consumers feel good about the economy. And the reason they look at consumer confidence is because consumer spending is 70% of all the spending that goes on in the economy. So it's a pretty important component of GDP. It basically includes everything you spend money on except for the things that we excluded from GDP in the last screencast. So it includes spending on durable goods. A durable good is a good that lasts three years or longer. So things like cars, refrigerators, washing machines, that counts under C as a part of GDP. It includes spending on non-durable goods, things that last less than three years, like t-shirts or food or, um, yeah, that kind of stuff. And it also includes spending on services done by consumers. So like dog sitting services, babysitting, someone paints your house, you go to the doctor, you get your hair cut, those are all services. And those would all count as a part of GDP under the C category of consumption spending or consumer spending. The next component, I, stands for investment spending. And in this context, I, as investment, doesn't mean what most people think investment to mean. It doesn't mean like investing in stocks or bonds or anything like that. You can think of investment spending as spending by businesses on capital goods. Remember, capital goods are goods that make other goods. So you can generally think of I as basically any spending by businesses that businesses do on their businesses to make more product. So I might include things like machinery, equipment, robots, all construction is considered I, investment. So we're talking buildings here, we're talking skyscrapers. Um, we're also talking things like houses. Now, this is kind of weird and it, the explanation's longer than the interest level should allow for. But all housing is gonna count as a part of I because houses are considered a kind of investment. Basically any construction, regardless of who's buying it, we're gonna count it as a part of this I. So if a business buys a robot, that's I. If a business buys a machine, that's I. If I buy a house, that's also going to be uh, counted as I, even though I'm a consumer. Any purchases of big stuff like skyscrapers or houses or stuff, that's going to count as a part of I. Third, changes in inventories. If you think back to the Titan game, remember what inventory is. Inventory is stuff you make that you haven't sold. Well, if we're piling up boxes in the back rooms of businesses, even if it's not sold this year, we want to count that as part of GDP because GDP is a measure of the stuff that we produce this year. So if inventories are rising, we want to try to capture the value of those inventories and add them to the amount of GDP. And we add them under this subcategory I, investment spending. Now, when we say investment spending, what economists mean is gross investment, not net investment. Let me give you an example. 
Let's assume that in the year 2010, there was a total of $100 million worth of investment. Let's say businesses bought $100 million worth of new robots. But let's also assume that depreciation was $60 million. And again, from Titan, I'm hoping you'll remember what depreciation was. Depreciation is when things break down, when um, things wear out. So when we say that depreciation was $60 million, what we're saying is that $60 million worth of robots died out in the year 2010. Well, here's a little formula. Net investment is equal to gross investment minus depreciation. In other words, you could think of net investment as how many more dollars worth of robots we have this year as opposed to last year. Gross investment is simply how many dollars worth of robots we bought this year. So in this example, we buy $100 million worth of robots, $60 million worth of robots wear out. So net, we have $40 million more robots than we had last year. Now that net number is an important number to kind of gauge how the economy is going. We want that net number to rise, for example, um, because it would mean more productive capacity. But in terms of calculating GDP, the number we're looking for is the, that gross number. Because if we bought $100 million worth of robots this year, it must mean that someone built $100 million worth of robots. And that's again what GDP is. It's a measure of our production of goods and services. So investment spending means gross investment. It doesn't mean net investment in this context, although you need to know what net investment is and how it differs from gross investment. All right, we got C, we got I, and now we're gonna count G. G stands for government spending. Government buys lots of goods and services too, and if we don't count the stuff that they buy, we're gonna have an underestimate of how much stuff we produce this year. So this is spending on goods and services by governments, things like tanks, uh, things like teachers, right, who provide a service. It includes spending on social capital, like libraries or hospitals, that kind of stuff. What it does not include are transfer payments, right? When the government's simply giving people money, not because they produced anything, but simply to help them out. So things like social security, welfare, unemployment compensation, that kind of spending doesn't count as a part of GDP for reasons we talked about in the last screencast. The last component of GDP, X sub N, stands for net exports. Um, now, net exports are, has to do with how much stuff we're producing here and selling to other countries and how much stuff other countries are producing and selling here. So a couple other abbreviations. Exports we're going to abbreviate with an X. And exports are things that we produce here but sell to other countries. Now we want to, cap, we want to count that stuff because again, GDP is a measure of our ability to make stuff. So if we're producing stuff here, but selling it in other countries, we want to count that stuff because that means that's part of our productive capacity. We're going to abbreviate imports with the letter M because the letter I was already used for investment. An import is something produced in another country, but bought here. And the idea is we want to subtract out that stuff because if we count spending on that stuff, that'll be an overestimate of what our GDP is. If I go out and buy a $30,000 car that was produced in Japan, and we count that spending, it's going to seem like our GDP is $30,000 higher than it actually is, because that car wasn't produced here, it was produced in Japan. So net exports are equal to exports minus imports. The amount of stuff that we're producing here but selling somewhere else, minus the amount of stuff that's being produced somewhere else, but they're selling here. So really simple example. Let's say we have $200 million worth of exports. That means we produced $200 million worth of stuff here and sold it somewhere else. And let's say we have $700 million worth of imports. Well, in that case, our net export number would be negative 500 million, meaning we're buying $500 million more stuff from other countries than they're buying from us. And if you look at the formula, GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus X sub N, you'll notice that this is gonna actually detract from our GDP. And this is what it's like in real life. We'll talk about real life um, net export numbers, but they've been negative for quite a long time and uh, each year it's just a question to the extent, uh, of the extent to which they're gonna be more or less negative. 
Turns out that we like to buy other people's stuff a lot more than other people like to buy our stuff for all sorts of reasons, uh, reasons we'll talk about. All right, well, if you put it all together, you get one measure of GDP. This is, this is the expenditures approach. If we add up all the spending that consumers do and all the spending that businesses do and all the spending that governments do and all the spending on net exports, we can get one measure of GDP. Now, before we leave this little topic of how to calculate GDP, we've got to talk about one slight little mathematical problem. The problem is that GDP is a monetary measure. It's measured in terms of dollars. So take this little hypothetical. Let's say that as a nation, as a country, in the year 1920, we only produced one thing, a car. Now, cars were much cheaper than, uh, in 1920 than they are now. Uh, a car in 1920 might have been $500, which was a lot of money at the time, um, but not a lot of money relative to today. Let's fast forward to the year 2011. And again, let's say that as a country, we only produced one thing, a car, one car that year. Now, a car in the year 2011 might go for something like $25,000. Perhaps you can see what the problem is. In each case, in the year 1920 and the year 2011, we produced one car. And GDP is supposed to be a measure of our ability to produce stuff. So it seems like we produced basically the same amount of stuff, pretty close, in both 1920 and 2011, one car. But if we use these numbers for GDP, it's going to seem like we made a lot more stuff in 2011 than we did in 1920. GDP would be $25,000 in 2011, only $500 in the year 1920. The reason for that is that prices tend to rise over time. We're going to call that inflation in a, in a little while. And that inflation is making things look like GDP is a lot higher in 2011 than it was in 1920 when it actually wasn't. The problem is that these numbers are nominal numbers. The word nominal means in name only. In other words, they're kind of like meaningless, meaningless numbers because they're not adjusted for the fact that prices change over time. So what we need to do is convert these nominal numbers into what are called real numbers. A real number is adjusted for price changes. It's adjusted for inflation. And it allows us to really compare one year to the next. So again, we have this car from 1920 that was worth 500, and we have a car from 2011 that was uh, sold for $25,000. The way we convert nominal numbers into real numbers is through the use of something called a price index, which we're going to explore more in depth in a future screencast, but for now you need to know the basics. A price index is a general measure of prices in the economy. And the way we calculate it is by first picking any year and calling it the base year. It doesn't matter what year we pick. It could be 1920, could be 2011, could be 1505. We pick a year and we call it a base year and we assign it a price index of 100. That's kind of like our standard met ruler now, our standard measure of what prices are. We can judge everything now by prices in that year. So if in the next year prices were to double, the price index would be 200. And we can use these price indexes, or indices, to compare one year to the next. What we're going to use these price indices for now is to convert nominal numbers into real numbers. And to do that, there's a formula you need to know that becomes pretty important. It looks like this. Real is equal to nominal divided by the price index times 100. Now, in this context, we're talking about GDP, but what you're going to learn is that we can convert any nominal number into a real number using this formula. So in the future, we're going to be converting nominal wages into real wages. We're going to be converting nominal GDP into real GDP. Whenever we're doing this, we're converting nominal numbers, kind of meaningless, not price-adjusted numbers, into real numbers, numbers where we have been excuse me, adjusted for the fact that prices have changed. So simple example. Let's say that nominal GDP in the year 1990 was 5.8 trillion. And let's say the price index in that year was 72. Let's say that real GDP, real GDP, 
in 2005 was 12.6 trillion. And we wanted to know in which year we actually made more stuff, in which year GDP was higher. Well, if nominal GDP in 1990 was 5.8 trillion, that really doesn't tell me much because that nominal number is a number not adjusted for prices. I see that the real GDP in 2005 was 12.6 trillion. And that's a meaningful number. If it's real GDP, what they're saying is this number has been adjusted for prices. So I can't compare these numbers yet until I convert them both into real numbers. And using the formula, here's how I would do it. Real GDP in the year 1990 would be equal to 5.8 trillion, that's nominal GDP, divided by the price index, in this example 72, times 100 is equal to 8.05 trillion. So now that I've converted that number into a real number, I can really compare, that's terrible, these two years. And I can definitively say that GDP in 2005 adjusted for prices was actually higher than it was in 1990 that we actually produced more goods and services, and the number didn't just go up because prices tend to go up over time. They went up because we actually produced more stuff. All right, that's it for this screencast. I will see you next time. So is it any wonder people are afraid of technology? Technology! Oh my God.